waiting on my so welcome everyone to our first Wild for Wildlife series, Understanding Coyotes. My name is Peyton Homiak and I'm the Environmental Coordinator for Community Strategy and Engagement with the City of St. Albert, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, before we begin, uh, there are a few housekeeping items to keep in mind. Uh, please note that this webinar will be video recorded as I just started the recording. Um, the session will be made available for viewing on the City of St. Albert's and Sturgeon County's public website or any forums using the recording and the transcription. The recordings could include a full visual and audio recording of all presenters and any presentations. If you have any questions regarding the collection and use of your personal information, please contact the City of St. Albert's FOIP coordinator at foip at stalbert.ca or call 780-418-6663. Uh, a reminder that your audio and video will be muted for the duration of this webinar. We have received a couple questions in advance, but if you have any questions during the presentation, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, any time during the presentation, and we'll do our best to adjust, address these questions and provide you with answers at the end. The presentation will take 30 to 40 minutes, and we will leave a 20 minutes at the end for these questions. And now I will pass it off to my colleague, Melissa Logan, to introduce our guest speaker. Thanks, Peyton. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Melissa Logan. I'm the Environmental Coordinator for Sturgeon River and Natural Areas. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Colleen Cassidy St. Clair. Um, Colleen is a professor of biological sciences at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada, where she has been for 25 years. She and her students aim to use theory and methods from animal behavior to solve problems in wildlife conservation and management. Work from her lab addresses diverse species in a range of landscapes from protected to urban areas. Their work has supported over 100 scientific publications, several policy documents for government and industry, lots of media interviews, and thousands of opportunities for citizens to engage and participate in science. Thank you, Holly, for, uh, for joining us this evening. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, all of you in St. Albert and Sturgeon County for inviting me to talk to you tonight about coyotes and uh, for your questions as well, folks that sent those in advance. I'll begin by sharing my screen here. And just take a moment for that to come up. And I'll check, can everyone see that all right? Looks great, Colleen. Yeah, super, thank you. Okay, well, um, as Melissa mentioned, I'm a professor in biological sciences at the university. I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you ordinarily <laughs> from Edmonton, Amaskwasa Wasahikanan, our Treaty 6 territory. Uh, currently, though, I'm in Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, the traditional lands of the Maori people. Um, everybody's aware of how some species manage to live with us in cities very readily and uh, collectively they've become known as um, urban exploiters or urban adapters and other species are not very good at living with us in cities or other developed areas and and those species uh, are sometimes termed avoiders and what is clear across the world is that um, there's problems with both of the extremes, avoiders and exploiters. Avoiders are often threatened species, declining species, ones that we would like to see more of that can't seem to cope with human infrastructure and human presence. And exploiters we see a little too much of. Those are species that might be hyperabundant in areas where humans occur and might cause all kinds of problems. So in my lab, we work on this sort of continuum of species, uh, but increasingly I'm drawn to the species that would be called adapters or exploiters. I find those species really fascinating because of the way usually they use some kind of behavioral adaptation that is quite flexible to live among people. And these are all species that uh, my students of and I have studied over the last uh, decades. But the one that I'll talk about today is uh, coyotes and urban coyotes in particular. So these species that are exploiters or adapters that tend to get in trouble with people are usually carnivores or they're large or they're considered to be a pest species 
uh, or in some cases, they're all three of those. Those are the species that are really prone to what's known as human wildlife conflict, which traditionally means that uh, the wildlife inconveniences humans in some ways. But increasingly, this term is applied to situations where humans are, are inconveniencing the wildlife as well. So coyotes, I think, um, are squarely in, in, uh, in both categories. They're a tremendously adaptable species. Their range has expanded tremendously in North America over the last couple of hundred years or perhaps longer. Um, through ancient times, coyotes are associated with people. They're very good at figuring out how to exploit people, um, using people to access resources that they value, um, like food typically, but sometimes also shelter. And in this way, coyotes have expanded their range, corresponding partly with European colonization of the continent, but also with the disappearance of wolves, which are their main uh, competitor and, and predator. So particularly in the East, as, as wolves were uh, nearly exterminated, uh, coyotes had more and more of a foothold and became abundant in the East just as wolves were disappearing and in fact hybridized with them. So eastern coyotes um, are, are actually hybrids with uh, eastern wolves, sharing about 50% of the variable part of the genome with wolves. They're pretty fascinating animals. Um, <clears throat> a few characteristics of their natural history are quite unusual for mammals. They're monogamous. Uh, a mated pair might stay together for their whole lives, as long as both members of the pair are, are alive and as long as they're successfully raising pups. And they tend to stay together in loose pair bonds year round. That's very unusual in mammals. Also unusual is the fact that both parents contribute to raising the young. So one of the reasons that koi dogs, hybrids between dogs and coyotes, don't tend to have high success is because dogs don't have this habit. The, the males just take off. And without that, uh, females are not able to raise coyote, coyote pups successfully. They breed once a year. Um, typically, the breeding season is in January and February. Uh, pups are born uh, in usually early April. They emerge from the den usually in early June. And then they disperse from the den area, their natal site, um, usually by August or September under natural conditions. But often in cities, they don't actually disperse. They might stay with their parents because there's enough food to support that for uh, more months or, or sometimes even years, uh, potentially even participating in helping to raise a subsequent litter. Litter sizes are highly variable in their size, ranging from 2 to 11. And typically larger litters occur in areas where coyotes are being persecuted by people. So somewhat ironically, if coyotes are, are being culled by people, they tend to breed at younger ages with larger litters, a kind of life history adaptation to that situation. Their lifespan is usually three to eight years, but one coyote in our sample measured by tooth rings was 14 years old, very old for an urban coyote. And they're really omnivorous in their diet. In fact, they can eat almost anything. And in a study of coyote diets measured from stomachs, we, we found all manner of uh, natural foods and all kinds of anthropogenic objects in their stomachs. Of course, uh, probably everyone knows coyotes are also a source of conflict with people. And uh, historically, this was mostly a conflict with livestock, particularly sheep which coyotes are quite adept at killing. They usually grab them by the throat and, and bite them lethally. But coyotes are also a bit of a nemesis for dogs. Uh, dogs sometimes chase coyotes, coyotes sometimes chase dogs. Uh, often the outcome is, is not good for one or, or both parties. And sometimes, but quite rarely, coyotes attack people. And I'll come back to these sources of conflict later. All of these sources of conflict are some of the reasons that coyotes are uh, quite, quite detested in many communities, especially rural communities, where there's a culture, a, a long-term culture of killing coyotes on site whenever possible. Um, that is perfectly legal in virtually every jurisdiction outside of a city. Coyotes can be hunted in Alberta year-round on private land. 
They can be hunted on public lands um, between October and February. And uh, they can be hunted very extensively. So as one example of that in Saskatchewan, a few years ago, there was a bounty on coyotes. Uh, the Saskatchewan government felt their populations were too high. They put a $20 bounty on coyotes and uh, 18,000 animals were registered in just that few month period um, in response to the bounty. But it was stopped as a management technique because of the explosion in rodent populations that was already occurring. In urban areas, uh, culling coyotes is, has become quite rare across North America. That was widespread once where coyotes weren't much tolerated in urban areas. Uh, over the past couple of decades, typically they are tolerated as long as they aren't acting aggressively in which case they're they're removed in a more targeted way, not as part of a population-wide cull. So in urban areas, the major source of mortality for coyotes is actually collisions with vehicles. There's a lot of hunting of coyotes still in Alberta. In fact, this Facebook group uh, called the Alberta Hi Coyote Hunters has uh, five and a half thousand members. So still a very prevalent. Um, hunt of coyotes going on in, in rural areas pretty much everywhere across the continent. Another place where coyotes are prevalent is in Indigenous lore. Um, almost all the Indigenous groups of North America have legends associated with coyotes. They range from being very flattering for coyotes to uh, very derogatory for coyotes. But almost invariably, they, they celebrate the incredible craftiness of coyotes, um, which are often known as the trickster. And they celebrate the intelligence of uh, coyotes and their wiliness around people and their, their ability to outsmart people, something that we're still experiencing. So Edmonton is like many cities uh, that has transitioned over the last 20-ish years from um, kind of a quietly conducted culling program of coyotes, um, maybe a little more than 20 years, to an attitude of coexistence that it tries to um, achieve mostly by education of the public. So a recent campaign in Edmonton is this one, are you coyote R or are you coyote wise? Or are you aware and be coyote wise? Uh, this is one that we participated in with the city of Edmonton, uh, first conducting a survey with several thousand residents and then uh, rolling out this education campaign. And I won't go into the details of the campaign except to say that its, its main message is to encourage people to view coyotes as a natural part of ecosystems. Um, they are a natural part of ecosystems, including eco urban ecosystems. And they play some beneficial roles in those ecosystems. So coyotes serve as, as scavengers, cleaning up uh, carrion of various sorts. They manage populations of small mammals, especially rodents. And they also disperse seeds, uh, especially of berry producing shrubs. And lots of people find coyotes just uh, a nice thing to have in their, in their uh, lives in urban areas. They are the largest carnivore that remains abundant in urban areas in North America. That's a little bit of background about coyotes. Where I'll go now is uh, just tell you a little bit about the work we've done on them. So in 2009, I started the Edmonton Urban Coyote Project. From the beginning, it's been a collaborative project with the City of Edmonton and Animal Damage Control, a wildlife management company in Edmonton that I think you'll hear about um, in uh, maybe a month's time or some weeks time when where their principal, Bill Abercrombie, is coming to speak to you. Our work um, has had a, a number of dimensions and it's been supported by a whole bunch of people. And here I'd like to just briefly introduce you to uh, some of the core people over many years. Bill, I mentioned already, uh, my first PhD student on this project was Maureen Murray. Several other students named here have uh, taken up the, the coyote mantle since then. And I've had uh, some collaborators as well. The one whose work I'll uh, mention, who is associated with work that I'll mention today is Howie Harshaw. And I've had tremendous support and collaboration from the city of Edmonton Rangers over many years. I'm grateful to all these people. So what kind of things have we've done? The first thing I'll mention is something that we began in 2009, but reported on uh, for the first time only recently. And this is the experience of people with coyotes. 
And what this map shows you, uh, you might be able to pick out Edmonton's River Valley running from the southwest to northeast there. It shows you reports from individuals about coyotes collected by our website over that 10 year period between 2012 and 2021 that amounted to uh, about 9,000 public reports of coyotes, providing a tremendous amount of information about where people were seeing coyotes, when they were seeing them seasonally and times of day. But also in the comments that people were able to leave and often did leave, it gave us indications of what people were experiencing in terms of the behavior coyotes exhibited, uh, as well as their own perceptions of those coyotes and the context of their experience. Oh, Colleen, I think we lost you. Experiences, for example, whether they were back now. Yep, Thank you're back you now. Uh, we'll I able. just got a note saying my internet connection is unstable. So I'm sorry about that. That Peyton, that was a perfect thing to do. Uh, if that was Peyton who said that. Yep. Uh, please just do that again if it happens. And I'll just oh, yeah. pause for a moment time. because it, it always comes back right away. But if you um, like, you can shut your video off. Maybe we'll shut your video off, but we can still hear you. So maybe that'll help the internet connection. Yeah, that's a good idea. I will turn my video off. Perfect. And uh, that'll save us a little bit of bandwidth. Good idea. Okay. So one of the things I want you to notice about this map is the vast majority of these observations were occurring in residential areas. And of course, that would be expected because that's the majority of a city. But what you can see in this graph on the right is that there are more observations occurring in residential areas than would be expected just from their spatial footprint. And what we learned um, by looking at these, uh oh, there we go, uh, reports in more detail is some things about the trends over time. So these graphs show you those trends over years from 2012 to 2021. And you can see that avoidance behavior by coyotes in yellow is declining as descriptions in these reports. And there's a little bit of a decline in indifferent behavior as well. And by contrast, bold behavior by coyotes as described by reporters is increasing over time. And aggressive behavior, as described by reporters, is, is pretty stable and stationary over time. Corresponding with those observations of coyotes are some changes in human concern or human perceptions. In yellow, again, you can see that there's been a bit of a decline in positive perceptions of humans about coyotes, a sort of steady state of neutral perceptions, and a very slight increase in negative perceptions. So this situation is one that probably many people have the impression of from the news media, and it stems from some very well publicized experiences of people with coyotes. Here's a couple of uh, the more widespread of these news reports. There was a terrible attack by coyotes on um, a toddler in Burnaby a few years ago. And right here in Edmonton, there was a, an attack by coyotes on a toddler in Coronation Park, which is a very urban park, not at all close to the River Valley, surrounded by commercial and residential and industrial areas. So these kinds of attacks are increasing across the continent. Um, and they are not only involving children. Sometimes these attacks are involving adults, uh, sometimes fairly large adults, but uh, it seems more often small adults than large ones. And a couple of years ago, there was a big spate of these attacks, one in uh, Vancouver in Stanley Park, where there was an unprecedented 45 attacks on people. And another in Calgary in the same year when there were eight attacks on people by coyotes. So although these are still rare in comparison to the number of coyotes that live in urban areas across the continent and the number of encounters coyotes and people have with each other, they are undeniably more common than they used to be. And these more common attacks are uh, causing people to have more concern uh, when they meet coyotes, which is exacerbated by the change in coyote behavior that seems to be becoming bolder. There's another source of uh, conflict with coyotes that's less well known. Uh, this one concerns a parasite. It's a tapeworm that occurred in North America historically called Echinococcus multilocularis. 
But as is the case for lots of small animals, um, beyond the species level, there's lots of variants that are, are uh, known often as strains or typologies. And there's a particular strain of this parasite that wasn't found in North America until quite recently, a European strain. It was first found in a domestic dog in BC in 2009. And starting in 2013, there became reports of human cases of this tapeworm. So between 2013 and 2019, there were 15 human cases confirmed in Alberta. Uh, none that I know of in that time period, uh, maybe one in Saskatchewan, but virtually none anywhere else in North America. That um, tapeworm was reported from genetic typing to be widespread in wildlife uh, by 2019. So this is now the dominant strain of this tapeworm in wildlife. Um, coyotes and foxes across North America. And by 2023, as of uh, a newspaper report just recently um, that you could look up here if you wanted to by um, CBC's Madeline Cummings, there's now 30 confirmed cases of this uh, tapeworm in people uh, in Alberta. There's a goal to begin a national tracking program for it. And of course, there's growing public concern and that's because this tapeworm is, uh, uh, it's fatal in people if it is not treated, 95% uh, fatality rate without treatment. It kills thousands of people in Asia in particular, particularly in the Mongolian steppe annually. And um, even if treatment is um, uh, available, it's difficult to detect. So this parasite often is lacking symptoms altogether, asymptomatic for five to 15 years. So if you put that together with the fact that it's only been detected in Canada since 2009, that means there might be many more cases um, occurring than, than are currently detected. So that's why there's been some public health warnings about this parasite. We've done some work on it. Um, these samples all involve coyotes that, that we collected with the help of uh, Edmonton and also St. Albert. Melissa Logan has been involved in some of those and the trappers that I mentioned at Animal Damage Control. And what we found from those sources is that the rates of infection of coyotes, the prevalence of this parasite in coyotes is uh, typically around two thirds of the animals exhibiting it. I should mention here, cause it'll be important later that this parasite is one that is what's known as trophically transmitted. That means it has two hosts. Coyotes are the definitive host or other canids uh, like foxes. And the intermediate host is a rodent of some sort. Um, it might be a mice, a mouse or a vole. Uh, there are some reports of a few other rodents that are positive for uh, this parasite, but most often in our part of the world, it's a red-backed vole. So um, those are the sources of conflict. Now, when we began the project in 2009, we already knew uh, about all of these potential sources of conflict, particularly the physical ones. What we wanted to know was two things, two questions. How did these different types of coyote characteristics or behavior, habitat selection and movement, diet, and health and condition, how do those three things contribute to conflict? We thought that if we understood those well, we would be in a position to recommend mitigations that could help address those conflicts. And uh, you'll see later that we recommend some pretty obvious things like uh, keep garbage in secure containers and keep dogs on leashes, but also some things that uh, until recently weren't much recommended like wearing gardening gloves and uh, <laughs> carrying tennis balls weighted with sand. And I'll come back to those later. So I'll go now to what will be actually the very end of the talk and just tell you um, sort of the conclusions of this last um, 14 years of work. And then I'll explain how we came to these conclusions. So as recommendations for how citizens could reduce conflict with urban coyotes, we suggest that uh, most important is to prevent coyotes from accessing human sources of food. So control access to food. Number one. Also important, though, is parasites. Prevent human exposure to zoonotic disease. Coyotes carry a few different zoonotic diseases, but this tapeworm is by far the most important of them. 
habitat is the third, discourage coyote use of residential areas, especially for denning. Pets, protect and control pets and livestock. And we've worked up this figure um, that describes coyote kind of living conditions that would range from natural habitat, eating a natural diet with this nice healthy looking coyote up here in the top left, that is intended to show how as coyotes develop a more anthropogenic or human origin diet and live in more anthropogenic habitats, they develop quite poor body condition, shown here in the bottom right, that seems to be mediated by parasites. And once they cross this line into this lower right quadrant, it's very hard to reverse that. And I'll show you also that conflict with coyotes is much more likely to involve these, these sickly animals. So let me show you how we came to those conclusions. First up, food. Well, it's a lot more than you might imagine. It's more than just garbage or the uh, residues of fast food um, that might be found around dumpsters and that kind of thing. It's also compost. It's also uh, vestiges of encampments in the river valley. It's also the mice and voles and squirrels and rabbits that take advantage of human shelter around buildings. It's also fallen fruit. And not only fallen fruit, it's also fruit in fruit trees. And several people have shown me pictures they've taken or videos of coyotes showing amazing ability to climb trees to get fruit. And um, with the possible exception of rodents, but for that parasite, none of these food sources are ideal for coyotes. And we were particularly worried about compost. That's because compost uh, as something that's rotting, breaking down with fungal decomposition is full of something called mycotoxins. Those are just the metabolic products of decomposing um, material. So they're, they're metabolites of fungal growth that are very bad for animals that eat them. They're bad enough, in fact, that the federal government has standards for how many of these mycotoxins, what concentration of them are allowed in animal feed. And that's what's shown with these uh, dotted lines here on this graph. So when we measured compost samples, taking these core samples, for these three different mycotoxins, we found that two of them exceeded those federal specified amounts. And the amount that an animal has to eat of these mycotoxins is not very much to experience the immune suppression and, and disease progression that comes from eating moldy food. So in the case of T2 toxin, it would be about the size of a blueberry daily, maybe a cherry for ochratoxin A. And coyotes would easily consume this amount of mycotoxins from compost if they were eating it regularly, as we've shown that some coyotes do. And what we've also shown is that coyotes that are accessing compost as a regular food source are exposed to much higher rates of tapeworm eggs. So these are taken from scat samples of coyotes at compost sites and then urban natural sites. You can see that there's 10 times as many tapeworm eggs in the coyote scats found around compost. And that doesn't uh, surprise anyone who studies parasites because of this trophic transmission that I mentioned already. Uh, the other thing that really likes to be in compost heaps, of course, are rodents. So there's a, a positive feedback loop here between rodents and coyotes sharing these tapeworm parasites. That's not all though, um, urban coyotes uh, differ generally from rural coyotes, not only that in that they eat all of these um, kinds of sort of non-foods, um, which I'm showing you here a, a little bit wider. Rodents, of course, are foods, but uh, urban animals are eating more of them, including more of them that are likely infected with this echinococcus tapeworm. They're also eating a lot more vegetation, which in general is not a high quality food source for coyotes. And they're eating more anthropogenic food, which uh, includes all kinds of things. We, we find things like muffin wrappers in their stomachs and bits of tinfoil in their scats. And this corresponds to poorer condition for these urban coyotes. This series of plots shows that for kidney fat index, the rural coyotes are healthier, they have more fat. 
for spleen mass, which indicates uh, sort of engagement of the immune system. Urban coyotes have larger spleens, suggesting they're fighting more infections. And as an overall body health score, using several metrics, urban coyotes, again, are, are less healthy than rural coyotes. And importantly, urban coyotes have a 50% higher prevalence of this dangerous tapeworm, Echinococcus multilocularis, than do rural coyotes. So these are bad news uh, stories for coyotes, but also for the people that share space with them. We think that a lot of this uh, effect of their kind of crappy diet is occurring through disruption of the microbiome. So this is a hot topic for humans as well. Probably everybody's heard about how uh, eating crappy diets changes your microbiome, which changes your immune function and overall makes you less healthy. In coyotes, we think it works like this. We compared the uh, intestinal biota of, of coyotes from rural and urban uh, locations. And we found that those rural animals tended to have high rates of these uh, bacteria. These are all associated with protein digestion, suggesting these animals are eating mostly prey. These animals had higher body condition, which we think helped them forage more efficiently, which helped them get even more protein from prey and have less reliance on anthropogenic food. But the opposite kind of feedback loop occurred here. These coyotes had uh, bacteria in their guts that were higher in diversity, uh, species richness as well as diversity, which might have prevented them from having their microbiome adapt well to their diet. And they tended to have more lactic acid bacteria, which is uh, a group that's associated with carbohydrate digestion. They had lower body condition, which probably meant it hard, made it harder to forage efficiently, made it harder to obtain prey in their diet, and made them more reliant on anthropogenic food. So this is the mechanism by which we think that these urban coyotes are, are just generally sicklier. Uh, there's a few more implications of these poor diets. We found that eating these anthropogenic food is associated with uh, conflict in coyotes. So here I'm showing you a graph that used stable isotopes measured from the claws and hair of coyotes uh, that we had as carcasses or that we captured as live animals. It's measuring two things, uh, isotopes of carbon, which are associated with um, C4, it's a physiological detail about plants. C4 plants include tropical grasses, which are very rare in our environment, which makes that a really good metric for consumption of corn because it's a C4 grass. And corn doesn't grow uh, much in this part of the world, but it is very common in any kind of processed food. So when we find this in high amounts in coyotes, it means they've been eating uh, processed anthropogenic food. Protein is well measured by nitrogen, isotopes of nitrogen, and it's a good measure of prey consumption. And what we found when we compared coyotes that were or were not reported as being in conflict with people is that they differed in these signatures. The urban coyotes that were in conflict were eating more carbohydrates and less protein, and the urban coyotes that were not in conflict, uh, the opposite. And we think, we speculate, that this may also be changing the behavior of coyotes. Uh, this comes from putting this result together with our microbiome work. And uh, a particular story, an, an anecdote that occurred in Edmonton a few years ago, when a single coyote, uh, we think from investigating the site, was responsible for killing a 110 pound Bernese mountain dog. So a 40 pound coyote killed an animal about three times its mass by pinning it to the ground, biting it in the neck, where it, it bled out without even any sign of a tussle. And interestingly, this coyote uh, that Bill's team later, later lethally removed entirely lacked fusobacteria in its gut. And that's the one that I mentioned was associated with protein digestion, suggesting that this coyote's behavior might have been changed by this high carbohydrate diet. I should mention that a similar phenomenon has been found in dogs. Highly aggressive dogs also lack fusobacteria in some of the measures that have been made. 
So it's important to keep coyotes from eating uh, anthropogenic sources of food, but it's hard to do. So here's a couple of examples of where um, coyotes are accessing this food that, that people might generally underestimate. Let me see if I can get this video to ah, come back. Uh, there we go. So this is somebody's backyard. That coyote is eating the fruit off this tree. And uh, it's jumping up, successfully grabbing some fruit. <laughs> the owner bangs on the window and the coyote beats it, having no problem with this five foot fence. Another thing that we're studying now is uh, the way all kinds of animals are attracted to seed that spills from bird feeders, including coyotes. I'll come back to that in a moment. And this is one of the reasons that for many years I've been advocating that Edmonton should have a bylaw that prohibits the intentional feeding of wildlife, uh, with the exception of suspended bird feeders, which was just too unpopular to take on. And there are other ways of mitigating this problem that I'll come back to. And we were successful in that, um, advocating for that. I wasn't alone in that. Many of us advocated for this bylaw that passed uh, a couple of years ago, which I think is a great development. Okay, number two is to prevent human exposure to parasites, especially the eggs of this new tapeworm parasite. And so this is particularly important for gardeners. Here's a couple of the gardens run by volunteers on the south campus of the University of Alberta. Uh, right behind this big barn, there's a huge compost facility that attracts uh, all kinds of rodents as well as coyotes, where we've found the prevalence of this parasite in coyote scat to reach 80%. So of course those coyotes are all over these gardens and uh, one would not want to accidentally ingest some of these microscopic eggs which can live in the environment for up to a year um, by say gardening and then stopping for lunch and eating a sandwich and eating a few eggs along with the sandwich. Now reassuringly, you'd probably have to eat more than a couple or so of these eggs to be infected in this way Emily Jenkins, a vet at the University of Saskatchewan, thinks that you'd have to eat these eggs repeatedly to actually become infected with this, this parasite. But clearly, from the 30 Albertans that have been infected, it is possible to do that. The other group that could be vulnerable are dog owners, um, because uh, dogs could acquire this parasite in a couple of ways. Uh, they might uh, just get it on their fur when they're rolling around in the grass, and then you might get those eggs on your hands when you're petting your dog. Or they might eat rodents that are infected um, and acquire the parasite in that way. Or they might roll in or eat the scat of, um, of coyotes that are infected. So um, I think one of the implications of, uh, I, I should have a better transition here. One of the implications of our work of uh, studying coyote stomachs and their diet, uh, the information we learned about diet from those stomachs and the presence of this parasite is that uh, there wasn't a very strong signal of diet on uh, parasite prevalence. We thought it would be the case that coyotes that ate more rodents would be more effect infected, or coyotes that ate more anthropogenic food would be more infected. Rodents because of exposure and anthropogenic food because of crappy diets and susceptibility. But what we found here is that the best predictor of infection was young age. Young coyotes were significantly more often infected, measured as presence absence, and significantly more infected, measured as the number of worms or intensity of infection um, than were adult coyotes. And health class was also important. The 50% of coyotes in the poor um, health category were more infected than the 50% of coyotes that were above the median of health. So this has some implications, I think, for trying to secure the things that degrade coyote health that I've shown you already, but it also has some implications for widespread culling programs, which tend to target young animals because they are the more vulnerable, naive um, animals that reduces the population in the short term, but actually causes the adults to produce larger litters and reproduce at younger ages. 
So culling programs, the literature shows, cause a younger age distribution of coyotes and other persecuted carnivores. And that would not be ideal if one is trying to manage the prevalence of this parasite. Another thing that I think we could do more of is identify and protect vulnerable populations of people from this parasite. And that might not be gardeners or dog owners. One group of people that my students and I are concerned about are people living rough in the river valley where they don't have access to washing facilities and where their exposure to these parasites might be quite high because we find a high density of coyote scat in the area of encampments, probably because of, of possibilities for food conditioning. And because the main symptom of this parasite uh, infection in humans is problems with the liver, uh, this population of people might also be, uh, medical personnel might be more likely to conclude that there's other reasons for problems with the liver than a parasite. So education would be needed, I think. Uh, I'll speed up a little bit here. I realize I'm at 40 minutes now. To say there's a couple other things humans can do to reduce their exposure uh, to conflict with coyotes. And a third one is habitat. And the most important thing for habitat is to make sure that you're not providing in your residential yard cover for coyotes. We found that cover was, uh, this is a measure of uh, how much coyotes are attracted to each of these features. Cover was the thing that attracted them the most, even more than food or fruit trees. This was things like compost or the presence of prey in yards. And of course, the thing that deters coyotes most successfully from yards is the presence of a fence uh, with a selection ratio under one here, meaning avoidance of yards with fences. But a fence is not necessarily enough because this example uh, occurred in St. Albert a few years ago. It got a lot of media at the time. Some of you might remember it. The coyote that denned successfully under this three season room did not even access that yard from the perimeter of, of that yard that, that could be easily seen. It got into that yard by going under this spruce tree and behind this shed. And in this tiny space, it was like half a foot wide, doing some sort of Houdini maneuver by digging a hole and then crawling under that hole <laughs> to get under this three season room and the owners of the room tried to dissuade the coyotes in a variety of way. It turned out to be coyote, singular, one female. But they could not keep her out. She was absolutely determined to get back in there. And it's because she had a litter of nine pups under that room. They had no indication whatsoever that the coyote was using that area and until uh, they started to see this digging. There was no attractants in the yard, no fruit trees, no compost. We think the reason the coyote was so attracted this this yard is because it offered security from other coyotes. So uh, sealing up areas like this and making sure coyotes can't get in there is really important. Uh, one of my students, Sage Raymond, is an expert tracker. She found an amazing 120 dens in Edmonton over a couple of winters. Here's some examples of what these dens looked like. Um, these dens were very often surprisingly close to human dwellings. I thought I put it on this slide, but maybe it's on the next one. 60% uh, of these dens were within 100 meters of a building. But often they were in such dense cover that you'd never know they were there. So this is another one of those plots with uh, numbers over one showing a higher likelihood the dens were more likely than the available habitat to be in areas with very dense hiding cover on steep slopes with an east facing den entrance with low amounts of herb cover, which usually mean quite a lot of light is available, but quite a bit of shrub cover. So those are the locations where coyotes like to den. And I think we could use that to keep them out of areas where conflict is likely. Here's an example of that. Here's Pollard Meadows Elementary School. Here's the lovely natural area that these kids get to take some of their classes in as part of the naturalization program at that school. <laughs> Here are all the coyote scats that Sage found in this area, potentially containing uh, the parasite. Uh, here's a coyote den uh, that was, uh, was in that area a couple of years ago. And along this uh, row of houses were several backyard composts. So once we know about this kind of association, of course, it, it would behoove us as a society to try to avoid this, get rid of these composts, 
maybe some clearing and uh, thinning in um, a woodlot like this that's designed to be a resource for young children and, and not a denning area for coyotes. Uh, we might also need to do more to manage this, what we call an ecotone, the division between houses and natural areas. Uh, Sage measured about 500 houses on this ecotone to find that in yards without intact fences, so these are ones that coyotes could get in, the ones they actually entered, which she measured with snow tracking, had significantly more food available, which took a wide variety of, of forms. Sometimes it was fruit trees, compost, birdseed, etc. They didn't necessarily differ in the prey habitat that was available, but they more often, significantly more often, had some kind of novelty object that the coyotes had chewed on. That was sometimes things like uh, balls or kids' toys or plant pots, human use things that would be covered in human scent and that we think would uh, help to habituate coyotes to being comfortable around people. And of course, as they're more comfortable with people, um, they would use that area more, deposit more scat, uh, so scats were closer to those uh, kind of accessed yards, uh, again, increasing risk of this transmission of this parasite. And we also found that those attractants were correlated with reports. Remember right at the beginning, I talked about the reports people had made to our website. And here you can see a variety of reports in red is the total reports, but these other ones are a variety of types of reports that that are associated with conflict, uh, like coyotes in the yard or a conflict uh, behavior is reported, or the people have a negative perception or the animal is unhealthy. And you can see here that these reports occurred more often as the percentage increased of yards that were accessed in each of the individual areas that SAGE measured. And the same was true with the number of shelters uh, available for coyotes and prey habitat novelty objects, and especially deer. So a habit some people have of feeding deer in hoppers from their backyard is a, a really effective way of attracting coyotes and, and potentially parasites to the edge of their yard. Um, another thing people can do in residential areas is haze coyotes. So this consists of just making them unwelcome. We conscripted a bunch of volunteers a couple of years ago to um, <laughs> train up as patrollers for coyotes in their residential area uh, in within neighborhoods. And then we fitted them out with a bunch of tennis balls containing sand. So they were the weight of a baseball tied with flagging tape, uh, which we intended to be sort of scary for coyotes. And these are a couple of plastic coyotes. Uh, that's why they didn't run away. So hazing is widely recommended for coyotes, but usually in the form of just waving your arms and shouting. And I suggest it should be a little harder than that, a little bit more intensive, something that is actually a bit fear inspiring for the animals. So this work is in preparation. Uh, Gabby Lajeunesse is writing it up now, and we were really grateful for the participation we had from uh, many dozen volunteers. Finally, protecting pets. Um, there's a bunch of things people can do to protect pets. Uh, fences is the most obvious one for residential yards, but they need to be fairly substantial fences, taller than this one and ideally um, blocking vision. If you have a short fence, you can install this kind of coyote roller and there's some instructions online of how you can make your own coyote roller instead of buying commercial ones. You might make a catio for your cat. If you have a short fence, you can protect uh, your animals uh, potentially by making fladry, which is just flagging tape tied to a string or rope that can extend the height of a fence. Leashing dogs is a good idea. Carrying a stick or a ski pole can be helpful. And I've even imagined that um, people with large dogs that have been approached by coyotes, which most likely try to bite the dog on the hamstring to immobilize it, might even tie these sort of outrigger things to a dog harness with flagging tape. Um, it's important to protect small pets, especially because it seems some coyotes learn to specialize on pets. And this is a paper we did a few years ago uh, with Nick Nation, a veterinary pathologist, explaining why it is that there are sometimes, and this is mostly from St. Albert, these tremendous spikes in the number of, of cats that have been brought to authorities with people saying, you know, from the looks of this cat, I think it was killed by some maniacal human because look, it has these like scalpel-like um, cuts in it. 
But when Nick analyzed these photos, and then I, I uh, participated a bit in that, every single one of 53 cats could be attributed to coyote predation, sometimes because we could actually see coyote underfur in the claws of the cats, which uh, the cat might have used to defend itself in its, its last moment. This is a picture from one of our remote cameras in Edmonton with a coyote carrying off its cat prey. So some coyotes seem to learn to target cats and then specialize on them, creating these spikes. Um, returning to this issue of fence, sometimes people underestimate the ease with which coyotes can go over fences. This is a fence I showed you a moment ago. It's the fence around the yard of this chihuahua um, that was killed by coyotes that jumped into its yard in a yard in Shored Park bordering on this agricultural area. So very attractive location for coyotes and very easy for them to spot that vulnerable little dog. Ooh, Colleen, I think we lost you. Were you muted? But sometimes one need not okay. hear them. You're uh -oh. back. You're Am I back, back now? Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I want to reassure folks that coyotes sometimes do an escorting behavior where they follow you and your dog at a distance, but don't approach closely. And usually what they're doing when they're doing that is just escorting you out of their territory. And uh, they're doing that for the safety of their own pups, present, future, or uh, recent past. And sometimes it's not a, a conflict behavior at all. And it's easy to avoid further conflict by just moving on. I mentioned earlier that dogs can be a source of infection of this parasite for people, but they can be infected themselves as well. This can be another thing that people might protect their dogs from. So dogs that roll in coyote scat and then groom their own fur or eat vegetation where there's coyote scat might become infected as rodents do as intermediate hosts. This would cause some problems with their liver that would make them kind of... Um, uh, just unwell and a, a vet could diagnose. Um, the other thing that coyotes or uh, dogs might do is eat rodents that are infected and this would make the coyote the definitive host and then it might poop out viable eggs of the parasite in its own poop. Dogs can be treated though with uh, a dewormer, quite a powerful one uh, that your vet will know about. Uh, Pre Prezaquantel, I think is how you say that. It's expensive, but very effective. And then finally, livestock might be collect, um, protected rather with uh, some ancient techniques, including the fladry that I mentioned earlier, uh, or trained guard dogs like uh, Great Pyrenees, which are very effective protectors of sheep, or some newer technologies like this device that we are using now for uh, Roosevelt elk on Vancouver Island. It's a, it's a boom box. <laughs> it's a motion triggered camera that then elicits uh, stimuli from this light strip and uh, the speaker. And we've set this up to be a variety of things, dogs barking, cougars growling, uh, people shouting, elk, get off my lawn, and that sort of thing. So summarizing, this is what I think are the four important things to do to mitigate conflict with coyotes. I think all of them are, are possible to change quite a bit to increase opportunities for coexistence with coyotes. I hope I've left a little bit of uh, time for questions. And uh, I want to thank you very much uh, for your attention and also thank all these individuals and organizations that funded our work. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sinclair, for your insightful presentation. I will get right into some of our questions. So our first question is, we get a lot of residents showing fear when coyotes are spotted in urban environments, more so now that our landscapes and cities are continuously expanding and shifting towards a more naturalized ecosystem. How can we shift this perspective? Yeah, that's it's such a great and perennial question. I, I think it's a multifold answer. Uh, education, I think, is the foundation of it so that people know how to avoid attracting coyotes into residential areas. And I think community-based hazing will play an important role too. Um, that's something that people can do to help protect not only themselves and their pets, but also their neighbors and other vulnerable individuals that might not be comfortable hazing coyotes themselves, but would benefit from that behavior going on in their communities. 
Right. Does anyone in our team, Sturgeon or St. Albert, have any anything else to add? No. I think in the interest of time, we'll we'll let uh, <laughs> okay these ones. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so the next question you did touch on a little bit, but um, we'll answer it again. So what are some ways to protect my dogs when we're going on our early morning walks and we approach or hear coyotes nearby? Should we scare them? If so, how? Yeah, a lot of people have that experience in early morning and late in the evening. Coyotes are crepuscular by nature, meaning that they're most active at dawn and dusk. I, I think ideal ways to keep those coyotes wary are to just monitor their behavior. If they seem to be approaching or acting boldly, uh, treat them aggressively with that hazing technique and also report them. It's really helpful for municipalities to know where there are clusters of uh, coyotes that are acting overly bold. I think of uh, about 40 meters as being the distance a coyote should <laughs> allow you to approach it before it runs away. If it lets you get closer than that, I would consider that to be a bold coyote that should be treated or reported or both. All right. Thank you for that. Um, and I think we'll have some time to do the last and final question for uh, what are some unique or different qualities of urban versus rural coyotes? I tried to show a few of the things we found in our sample uh, between urban and rural coyotes, but I think one of the main differences that probably many people um, that might be watching would know is the behavior of those two sets of animals tends to be really different when they see people. Rural coyotes tend to be really shy around people because of the, the commonness of persecution and urban coyotes tend to be bolder. So I would say that's the most obvious difference, <laughs> but another one would relate to those various condition metrics that I mentioned. Rural coyotes tend to be healthier. Great. Um, and then we have, we'll have time for one more. So when new housing developments pop up, do coyote packs relocate into the community? Yes, I think sometimes that does happen. That would be the one situation that I think could be named for you know, common perception by some people is that we are moving into their territory. It's not quite that way with coyotes as urban adapters and exploiters, coyotes are moving into cities from the surrounding area, um, undeniably. In fact, their density is generally higher in cities. But in that one instance where a new subdivision is being built, it often does displace some coyotes that live there. And that was what was uh, determined to be associated with those three attacks in Calgary in 2021. All three of those were associated with a den that was disturbed in a subdivision that was being built. So although I think it's fairly rare, some coyote conflict probably comes from exactly that situation. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you all. That ends our time for questions today. So we hope uh, you tune into our next Wild for Wildlife seminar, Preventing Wildlife Damage to Your Property. And Bill Abercrombie will be presenting uh, for that evening, and it will be on November 8th from 7 to 8 p.m. And I will just I will just put the link in the chat right now so you can have that. And then, Melissa, if you have anything else to add, go for it. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank all the all the people for joining online tonight. Thank you to Sturgeon County for for partnering with uh, with us on this uh, event, and of course, Dr. St. Clair. Thank you very much for tuning in from half a world away. We really appreciate it. Oh, you're so welcome. I appreciate your interest in turn. And if anyone has questions for me that they didn't have time for today, I I welcome those anytime by email. Uh, See St. Clair at uAlberta.ca. Great. We can probably pop that in the in the chat too. And oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Great. Right. Thanks, Peyton. Great. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care.